Okay. Excellent. Okay, so welcome back, everyone, uh, to our second class. Um, today, we're going to be diving in a little bit uh, more quantitatively into uh, the sort of things we need to understand about how do we actually look for life, how do we actually measure life, how do we actually measure um, you know, the sort of scales that are necessary to know uh, to what the probability of life is off the Earth. Um, so just a couple of quick uh, announcements beforehand. Um, remember, you have a weekly homework assignment. The first homework assignment is going to be posted up uh, probably by the end of today, possibly by tomorrow. Um, that's going to be due the following Friday. Now, all these homework assignments are mostly aimed at capturing the material that we cover the week before it's assigned. So it's going to be basically on the stuff that we talk about today and, and a little bit of yesterday. Um, uh, but that will be uh, posted up online. And then they'll be due at Fridays at 4 p.m. Uh, I'll have a box out just outside my office, which is SURF 340. This floor, that corner, because little science is physics 13, can't miss it. Um, and just to have that in by 4 p.m. Um, I do have a late turn-in policy. Uh, we are going to be talking about radioactive decay, so I have a homework decay policy. Uh, basically, you lose half your credit for every day that it's late, up until when it becomes an indistinguishable with the random fluctuations in the universe. Uh, so you got about two days to turn these in. So uh, try to get them in on time, but if you can't, you know, you'll get a little credit, but uh, try to get all the credit. Um, on the course website, I've got uh, a couple of links uh, to keep an eye on. Uh, one of these is ask your questions here. So if you have any questions about the course, if you have any questions about homeworks, reading quizzes, which are going to start next week, um, please post them there. It's, it's partly because it's hard to manage lots of individual email requests. This is actually not too big of a class, but when I taught 1C, I was getting like 300 emails a week, and that was a little hard. Um, so uh, it's also so that if you have a question, someone else in the class almost certainly has something like the same question. And so if we can archive these questions, that becomes a kind of useful FAQ for everyone in the class. So um, if you have questions, general questions, please post them up online. Obviously, if an individual question about something in the, in the course that affects you particularly, you can email that to me as well. And there's also a section there called burning questions. So if there's like some question about life in the universe that you've just been dying to ask, and you're maybe embarrassed to talk about it in here, I'm happy to field those either on the web form or even bring them up in class if there's something that maybe everyone wants to, to think about. Okay, so that's up there. Um, don't forget to sign up for your news report. I've got about five people signed up now. Um, starting next week, I will start placing you at time slots. So give you an opportunity to have some freedom of choice. Um, there's just a simple Google form that's on here. You can just fill out the dates. And I will make sure that there's no conflicts of material or anything like that. Uh, let's see what else. Um, lecture. So uh, you probably don't oh, aren't aware of this, but I'm actually recording the lecture right now on YouTube. So all the lectures will be online with the slides, but also the full sort of uh, presentation here. Don't worry, you're not captured on it, so it's just the slide. Even I'm not captured on just my voice. Uh, I'm a little scary at nine in the morning, so um, so if you know if there's something that you missed or or something that you want to kind of go back over again, uh, you have multiple ways of doing that. So um, I would recommend sort of making use of that. And then, as I mentioned, reading quizzes will be starting next week. Again, those will be due just before class, um, so that's profitable to kind of do them maybe the Monday and Wednesdays. Um, they'll be based on the material that we'll be covering in that class. And so, if you look at the syllabus, I have sort of the sections of the book that we'll be covering. So that's a good start for what you should be reading up on to answer the reading quizzes. Again, those are not meant to be like you know quizzes, like exams. They're meant to sort of start simulating your thinking for the discussion we'll have in class. All right. Last piece of news. Next week, we're going to have our first uh, one of the labs. Um, and that's the night observing lab. Now, this is actually going out and observing stars, which we have to do at night. Um, and so we're going to be doing one session on Tuesday. Is there anyone who absolutely cannot make a Tuesday night observing lab? Uh, it will be after sunset, which I think now is like 8 o'clock or something like that. Uh, my class gets on at 7. You're fine. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. So uh, if anyone has an absolute, absolute problem with that, let me know. Um, otherwise, we'll aim to have that. Now, the, the, the observing lab is going to be a worksheet. We're going to have telescopes out. It's kind of taking a look at the night sky and sort of getting essentially your bearings and how do you look at and make measurements of the night sky, which we'll be covering in more detail uh, next week in class as well. Okay, any questions? Okay. 
Um, so uh, keeping up with the modeling of how to do uh, these sort of news reports, um, last night I was looking around for some interesting things to talk about, and um, I stumbled on this story in the Washington Times uh, that the Library of Congress has been having a series of sort of talks uh, related to astrobiology. And in fact, uh, so this, this is an article that came out in Washington Times uh, just last week. Um, actually, yeah, just last week. Um, and they were talking about a talk that was being give, uh, given, uh, it was actually a big talk, it was a panel of speakers, all sorts of very famous people. Uh, astrobiology and religious imagination, <coughs> reigniting notions of creation, humanity, selfhood, and the cosmos. That's a pretty, pretty tall order uh, title. Um, so it talks a little bit about this. But as I was reading this article, one thing that really struck me is this line down at the bottom, or this couple paragraphs at the bottom, says, in September, a coalition of researchers and advocates seeking government disclosure about the existence of life beyond Earth have made their case with an open rebuttal letter to the organizers. And the library itself, citing them for omitting neglected and unacknowledged evidence. Mm. Uh, this group, which includes a US astronaut and a Canadian defense minister, uh, writes discovery presence and public revelation of sentient extraterrestrial life and the vehicles that appear to manifest this presence is the greatest story in history of humanity. All the available documentation indisputably suggests the government of the United States, in fact, withholding the information from its citizens and the citizens of the world. That's a pretty intriguing statement, yes? So just to summarize, there's, an, there's a couple astronauts and some famous people that are saying, hey, there's evidence of life off Earth and aliens and they're flying around spacecraft and the government knows it. Ever hear this story before? I was actually kind of excited. I was like, wow, this is in the Washington Times. So I followed the link um, to uh, where this statement comes from and this is, this is the, the breaking news release right here. Uh, and it basically says all the same thing that you know we're, we're ignoring all this UFO evidence that's out there, and uh, you know this is a shame. We should be bringing this out in the open and talk, talking about this stuff. And I started noticing that the the byline is from ZNN. Anybody know where ZNN? We hear something like ZNN, like CNN. So ZNN is the Zeland Communication News Network, and news service that takes you to the edge and beyond. That's a little. Interesting sign. Um, and then if you look a little bit more closely, they actually have this uh, description of what it's about. It's a new service dedicated to the compilation, distribution, and analysis of news relating to the disclosure of information concerning the extraterrestrial, extraterrestrial presence engaging the planet, manifest by the UFO phenomena, et cetera, et cetera. So why do I bring this up? Uh, the internet is full of lots of great, rich information. Uh, and part of the you know, your, your task is not just uh, students in this class, but also citizens of the world, is to understand sort of what's relevant for information and what's biased information. Um, and so, like I said, I was really excited when I read this initially, and then as you start tracking down the sources, you realize that, in fact, the origin of the statement comes from an organization that's specifically devoted to making such statements. Not investigating whether they are true, but in actually just kind of promoting that whole point. Now, we're in a world today where a lot of our news comes from opinionized, biased newsletters, outlets. It's, they make much more money uh, than the sort of, a, uh, quote, objective news outlets, although even objective news outlets in the 50s and 60s were definitely not objective in any way. Um, and so part of your analysis, not just for this news uh, you know, prompt thing, um, but also in, if you're writing reports and not just for this class or other things, it's a really understand what is the perspective of the people writing the information or giving the information or speaking perhaps in a lecture like I am right now. What is our perspective? What are our biases? This is part of the critical thought process of looking at such questions that we're asking in this class as is, is there life off the universe? Right? It's a hugely speculative question. And there's lots of people that have strong opinions one way or the other and varying degrees of evidence. <laughs> And your job as a, again, a, a person in civilization is to sort of weigh all this evidence and understand sort of what the probabilities based on the, the sources that are coming from. So I just take this as a cautionary tale. As you do your investigations in, in online research, you're going to find amazing <coughs> stories about life off Earth. Um, some are credible, some are not credible, and some are very hard to tell. Uh, and so it's very important to sort of dig down, not just into the information, but also where the information comes from. Right? That's part of the critical. Any questions on that? Okay. 
By the way, who saw the movie last night? What did you think? Do you have any nightmares? The spindly guy at the end? No? Okay. The spider looking figure was kind of creepy. Kind of creepy? Yeah. 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 That was high technology in the 1970s. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, any other questions about anything? Okay. Let's dive in. So today we're going to be talking about the entire universe in one day. This is a pretty tall order, so we'll probably have a little bit compacted in things. I'm going to gloss over some things that we're going to come back to later on in the course. This is meant to be an overview, uh, but it's also meant to put sort of the, the kind of um, observations, measurements that we'll be talking about through the rest of the quarter in context, in sort of a context of scale. Um, so we'll be talking about physical quantities to start off with. Uh, thank you for those of you who made it to the math uh, sort of workshop we had yesterday. Um, we'll be going a little more detail on that today. Um, and uh, we'll be using after that the course. And then we'll do sort of a survey of the contents of the universe. Uh, what are all sort of the major structures, uh, major sort of elements of the universe that we're going to be talking about. And then a little bit on the history of the universe. And again, this is going to be very abbreviated because it's only about an hour to go through all this stuff. So the first statement I want to make sure is clear that the universe encompasses a, a tremendous range uh, in scales. All right, And scales mean like powers of 10 in both distance and time, uh, in energy, and mass, and motion, all sorts of things that we have to sort of break down if we want to understand exactly what are the time scales for life, what are the probabilities of finding life. All of these are going to depend on the times and the scales of, of distance and time. So I want to start by showing a quick video here. Let's see if I have sound. So this is a video that was made um, actually back in the 19, well, it's all, it's all the date in there, I think it's 1960s, um, by a very famous pair of designers called the, called uh, Charles and, oh, I'll, I'll get her name up here in a second, but the, the Eames, uh, anybody have you ever heard of an Eames chair before? If you're in kind of design world, no one's in the design world? Okay. Um, so this is a couple who made uh, really just wonderful creative designs and all sorts of things, houses, buildings, chairs, stuff like that. But they were also interested in science and visualization. And so this is a video they made for IBM about the processes of science. Can you hit the, there's a button right next to you. Uh, keep going that way, that way, that way. Yes, push that one. Okay. Charles and Ray. The picnic near the lakeside in Chicago was the start of a lazy afternoon, early one October. We begin with a scene one meter wide, which we view from just one meter away. Now every 10 seconds we will look from 10 times farther away, and our field of view will be 10 times wider. This square is 10 meters wide. And in 10 seconds, the next square will be 10 times as wide. Our picture will center on the picnickers, even after they've been lost to sight. 100 meters wide. The distance a man can run in 10 seconds. Cars crowd the highway. Power boats lie at their docks. The colorful bleachers are soldiers' field. This square is a kilometer wide, 1,000 meters. The distance a racing car can travel in 10 seconds. We see the great city on the lake shore. 10 to the fourth meters, 10 kilometers. The distance a supersonic airplane can travel in 10 seconds. We see first the rounded end of Lake Michigan, then the whole Great Lake, 10 to the fifth meters. The distance an orbiting satellite covers in 10 seconds. <coughs> Long parades of clouds, the day's weather in the Middle West. 10 to the sixth, a one with six zeros, a million meters. Soon the Earth will show as a solid sphere. We are able to see the whole Earth now just over a minute along the journey. The Earth diminishes into the distance, but those background stars are so much farther away, they do not yet appear Is to move. too quiet for you in the back? A line extends at the true speed of light. In one second, it half crosses the tilted orbit of the moon. Now 
Now we mark a small part of the path in which the Earth moves about the sun. Now the orbital paths of the neighbor planets, Venus and Mars, then Mercury. Entering our field of view is the glowing center of our solar system, the sun. Followed by the massive outer planets, swinging wide in their big orbits. That odd orbit belongs to Pluto. A fringe of a myriad comets too faint to see completes the solar system. <coughs> 10 to the 14th. As the solar system shrinks to one bright point in the distance, our sun is plainly now only one among the stars. Looking back from here, we note four southern constellations, still much as they appear from the far side of the Earth. This square is 10 to the 16th meters, one light year, not yet out to the next star. Our last 10 second step took us 10 light years further. The next will be 100. Our perspective changes so much in each step now that even the background stars will appear to converge. At last, we pass the bright star Arcturus and some stars of the Dipper. Normal but quite unfamiliar stars and clouds of gas surround us as we traverse the Milky Way galaxy. Giant steps carry us into the outskirts of the galaxy. And as we pull away, we begin to see the great flat spiral facing us. The time and path we chose to leave Chicago has brought us out of the galaxy along a course nearly perpendicular to its disk. The two little satellite galaxies of our own are the clouds of Magellan. 10 to the 22nd power, a million light years. Groups of galaxies bring a new level of structure to the scene. Glowing points are no longer single stars, but whole galaxies of stars seen as one. We pass the big Virgo cluster of galaxies, among many others, a hundred million light years out. As we approach the limit of our vision, we pause to start back home. Okay, and we're going to pause. This lonely scene. The All right, so the point of uh, showing this is to kind of give it an idea of the sort of relative scales we're talking about. We've now gone from a human scale, which is about a meter scale. A meter's about here, all right? It's about half your height. Uh, and we have to go 24 orders of magnitude beyond that if we want to really encompass the entire universe. Uh, and so we're going to step through these kind of individually and sort of look at the individual scales, but it's good to keep an eye on, uh, keep in mind sort of this is the range of sort of length scale that we're talking about when we're looking at this question of life in the universe. We're talking about the entire universe, so we've got to get to these kind of numbers. But we're talking about life forms, which are kind of these kind of numbers. Uh, and these are sort of the scales that we need to think about. Now, um, when working with these universal size numbers, um, and some of you have taken, I know, phys uh, uh, physics classes, so I'm going to go kind of quickly through this. But uh, when we're talking about any of the physical quantities in this class, it's important to keep in mind that these are based on fundamental units of measurement. All right? And the fundamental units that we're going to be using throughout this class are meters, seconds, and kilograms. Right? So distance, time, and mass. That's really actually the only quantities we need to know at least the base level to understand essentially everything that we're going to be measuring uh, in this class. Um, but of course, on these units, all right, meter, second, all right, a kilogram, I'm about 70 of those, uh, those are very human size scales because we're using them. Um, when we get up to universal size things, of course, we have to start scaling those up. Now, we have other physical quantities that we can derive from that. So in addition to these basic things about time, distance, and mass, uh, we'll be using stuff like velocity and forces, energy, luminosity, but these are all derivatives of these basic units, right? Velocity is just the change of distance with time, all right? Force is the change in velocity with time times the mass, right? That's mass times acceleration, right? This is stuff you know. But all of these things are connected to those fundamental units. Now, one of the great things about doing any kind of math and physics is that you carry those units along it's actually a really great check to make sure that you're actually computing things correctly. So I want to encourage a practice that as you go through the problems that will be in this class, and they'll be very basic physics problems, but make sure you continue to carry your units because it's a good way to sort of keep track of what physical quantities you're actually talking about, and you can go back and double check your work. Now, one thing I want to point out here is that many of these things I put here, in fact, now I see it, almost all of them, are, are examples of rates, how things change with time. 
anything that's per time, change of something per time is a rate. So change in distance per time, change in, sorry, down here, change in energy per time, uh, these are all different kinds of rates. And we're going to see lots of rates as we talk about this class um, because, you know, there's things like how fast life evolves and all this other stuff that depends on rates. Um, as I mentioned, these, these basic fundamental units are on a human scale, but if we want to talk about universal scale, uh, it's important to make, start fostering the use of scientific notation. So occasionally, just for impact, I may show the full numbers here, but it's important that we're going to mostly be working with hybrid numbers that have scientific notation. So you've got your, your sort of quantity out in front, your coefficient, you've got your exponent, and always you have your units. Right? So it's important to just keep this practice of keeping these numbers together. Um, and I'm not going to go through the basic math, but it will be in the notes if you want to get a refresher on how you combine these, these very different quantities. Um, sometimes when you've got big numbers like this, it's actually a little more convenient to change the prefix of your units. All right? So we'll see a lot of examples of this when we go through the units of scales. So a good example here, 13 billion years is a sort of order of magnitude estimate of the age of the universe. But we can also write that as 13 giga years, right? So if you've heard of nanometers and kilopart, kilokilometers, uh, these are all using prefix to change that, that uh, exponent to something that's useful. And there's some common prefixes here, right? Kilo and mega and giga and tera, and even not very small scales. We're going to cover all of those scales in this class. Because we're also going to be diving into the atomic properties of things and understand how life works. So we're really going to be going through this entire scale system. Um, another way we deal with universe-sized numbers is we define a new unit based on the standard. And you're going to see this a lot when we talk about astronomical things, um, because there are just some scales that are just very natural to certain types of objects. So a good example is this number. This is, a, again, order of magnitude estimate of, this, of the radius of the sun, about 700 million meters. But a very convenient scale is that that is the radius of the sun, so we can identify a new unit called a solar radius. And the beauty of that is the radius of the sun in solar radius units is, let me say that again. The radius of the sun in solar radius units is one. That's exactly correct, right? And the beauty is if we're talking about lots of different stars, there's going to be some factor of one, you know, usually somewhere between a tenth and a hundred. That's an easier number to sort of deal with than 700 million. So all of these tactics you'll see used in sort of conveying the just sheer, sheer you know, range of numbers that we deal with uh, when we talk about astronomy, we talk about the universe. So keep an eye on these, how we do these, how we go from uh, either ex, you know, scientific notation or these prefixes or defining new uh, sort of scales. And here's some examples of some of the scales we're going to use solar radius and mass and luminosity. When we're talking about planets, we might use Jupiter or Earth scales. Um, or we might use something called an astronomical unit, which we'll talk about in just a moment. And light here is a very special one. Okay, so um, let's wake up our brains a little bit, and I want to do a little bit of a question here. And test your sort of estimation power. We did a little of this in the workshop, but let's try some more. Uh, take about four minutes to write your best estimates for these physical quantities. Don't look them up. Use your brain instead. You have four minutes. Also, make sure you write your name and the uh, date on the form there. Who still needs forms? Can you guys hand back? Okay, you got it, Mark. Thank you.
Who needs more time? Okay. Now, if you're struggling to get this as precise as possible, when I use the word estimate in this class, I mean to within a factor of 10. All right? Estimate is always within a factor of 10. So don't struggle with the decimal point. Okay, so can I have everyone hand the sheets this way, and then you guys hand them up this way, and I'll collect them back here. How many of you found this hard? Okay, why was it hard? <clears throat> well, looking those kinds of magnitudes, you so your brain doesn't work that way. <laughs> so the scale, sorry, yeah. the scale of width of the U.S., the scale of your age. Not in seconds. <laughs> Not in seconds. Okay, so there's there's scale of actual like how do I imagine the size of this thing? There's how do we transform between these two things that I would normally measure in what units? Years. Years. Yeah, that's easy, right? To something that second. Why do I make? Why did I ask you to make these conversions? Though? Any thoughts? Yeah. So, Distance, time, and mass. Well, it's distance, time, and mass, but why Why these particular units? Because I use <clears throat> Exactly, yeah. So these are the, these are the SI units. You've probably, if you've taken any physics classes, there's the SI units, there's the official units, whatever, like that. We pass them all up front. Um, and the, uh, the, the reason that we have these systemized units is that we can all sort of agree that a meter is a meter. That's the reason it's systematized. Right. In fact, um, the meter, the meter so, so early on this is very interesting because these things actually had physical objects that were supposed to be set for what they were. If you go in France and there's a museum of, of systemized units, SI Museum, um, they have a bar of iridium, platinum, which is exactly one meter. And it's exactly one meter because that bar defines what a meter is. Right. So there's a systemized that we've sort of worked at some point, I should say back in the 19th century, this is mostly when this was done, to agree on a system of units we all agree on. When we start in the U.S., we like to use things like pounds, uh, we use things like miles. Not everybody <laughs> in the world uses pounds and miles. And I just saw a great Australian YouTube video about how silly it is that we use miles and pounds like that. But all of science basically uses <coughs> these basic units, and again, we can then step them up more at university. So it's good to start getting an idea of how do you translate really big quantities or really tiny quantities, because we're going on both scales, to something that's a little bit more familiar to you. All right. Any questions on this? You will have other examples of this later on. And I'll have solutions for this posted on the, on the notes online. All right, one last important quantity I want to talk about is speed, and that's one particular speed called the speed of light. Uh, most of you have probably heard this before. All right, this is the speed of light in our SI units, meters per second, 3 times 10 to the 8. The amazing thing about this is that it's, um, it's Einstein's principle of uh, equivalence. Uh, and if you haven't heard of that particular principle, it's the idea that the laws of physics apply throughout the universe and in any frame of reference. So if I'm walking or I'm standing or <laughs> the ruler just fell, uh, the laws of physics haven't changed in any of those cases. And the only way for that to work is that the speed of light, which is a physical quantity, a physical constant in nature, has to be constant in all frames. 
Uh, and so this is an important number because it actually allows us to do a couple translations between these basic units. The first one is translating distance into time. One of the units we're going to use a lot in this class when we start talking about astronomy is the unit of light year. And that's simply the distance that light travels in one year. It kind of came up briefly in that Powers of Ten video. Uh, and that's just multiplying C times a year. Uh, and then the since is meters per second, we have to convert years into seconds, which turns out to be something like pi times 10 to the 7 to within 1%, which is pretty cool. Uh, and that's about 10 to the 16 meters. Now, how tall am I? Or are you? Two meters, yeah, one or two, order of magnitude is one meter, yeah, two meters, somewhere around there. This is 16 orders of magnitude greater. So this gives an idea of how much different astronomical scales are compared to normal human scales. And this is partly why astronomy is actually kind of a relatively new field. It took us a long time to develop the tools, the technology, and the conceptual understanding to appreciate things that are 10 to the 16 times bigger than us. Right, that's a big number. Now, uh, you've probably also heard the equation equals mc squared. C is there. That's the speed of light. That's also a way of translating energy between energy and mass. And we're going to see that when we talk about how stars work, how stars actually generate energy, uh, which allow them to shine, which allows heat to get to the Earth, and that's pretty important for life. Um, so we'll see this translation again. But the one reason I want to bring this up is that when we start talking about time scales that are on the distance of light years, which again is going to be very common for astronomy, this is the scale at which light travels, which is also the time that light travels to get to us from whatever source. So something that's one light year away, the light that we see today is the light that left that object a year ago. It took a finite amount of time for that light to get to us. And this is an important concept because in fact what it means is that as we look out into the universe, and in fact even when we look out into this room, we are looking into the past always. The light that is reaching our eyes or reaching our instruments is light that has taken time to travel to us. And that light was emitted sometime in the past. So even sitting here, 3 times 78 meters per second translate into something like a foot per nanosecond. That's my favorite little conversion. So like if I'm 10 feet away from you, I've really seen what you were doing 10 <coughs> nanoseconds in the past. So I wanted to stop you from stuffing that napkin in. But it's too late by 10 nanoseconds. Right? Everything's in the past. Keep that in mind as we go through. All right, any questions on just these basic numbers? Okay. Okay. So, uh, so let's start diving in and sort of marching through the universe on these sort of scales. And so we'll start with, uh, you know, our Earth. That's something we're very familiar with. It's a planet we live on. We can kind of conceive the planet, all right? You may have had some trouble conceiving the size of the United States, but we need to sort of think a little bit more globally if we're going to think about more, more broad terms of life. But the Earth is something that we could travel around, right? This is something that's, at least in modern technology, something that's on a relatively human scale, at least, you know, sort of supported by, by airlines. Um, and so that scale is something like 10 to the 7 meters, or exactly, sorry, this is actually the diameter, so not the radius, but the radius of the Earth in Earth radii units is what? One. Okay. So we may use Earth radii to describe other planets because we might be interested in planets like the Earth, or we might use SI units like this. Uh, turns out this is about a billionth of a light year, so it doesn't take light too much, too long to go back and forth between uh, different parts of the Earth. Um, this is uh, the next scale going out, so going sort of the next object away from this. This is actually a real image of the earth one system taken by an uh, infrared instrument called Themis on a, 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 a satellite mission called the Mars Odyssey Explorer. This was on its way out to go to Mars. Uh, often, our, as we'll talk about in space travel, sometimes we send satellites kind of to, to loop around planets to give them kind of a boost in velocity. Um, so as it looped around the Earth, it took a picture uh, back at the Earth and Moon. Uh, moon's about 30 radii away from the Earth, so you can put it on one picture, but it's kind of extended away pretty much. So that's about 3 times 10 to the 8 meters. 3 times 10 to the 8 meters. Sound familiar? That If I put a slash second in here, that's the speed of light. So the moon is about 1 light second away from the Earth, which means that any communications that we have with either astronauts or satellites that are traveling to the moon by their nature, are delayed by about a second. So again, it's not just the information we receive, but even if we're communicating out, there's always going to be a delay. 
So one second is not too bad, right? You can imagine sending something kind of almost in, in real time to the moon and having that control. We'll see that's a problem as we get further out. All right, uh, going further out, uh, here is the sun and the earth. This is not to scale in terms of size and distance. The size uh, of the planets are much, much tinier compared to the distances between them. Uh, but this distance is about uh, 10 to the 11 meters. And because this is such a big number, but also a very fundamental number in sort of scaling the sizes of planets around stars, we give it a special unit in astronomy <coughs> called the astronomical unit. Very creatively named, all right? But this astronomical unit is going to be the sort of natural size scale for planetary systems, right? This is the, si the, the size of the orbit of the Earth around the sun. And so as we'll see, <coughs> orbits of other planets around other stars are going to be some integer or, you know, some sort of very small factor around this one astronomical unit. So this is one of our new <coughs> units that defined because it's a very convenient unit in, in astronomy. Uh, this turned out to be about eight light minutes, and so you've, maybe you've heard like the old adage that the sun suddenly disappears, we'll be happily, blissfully unaware of it for about eight minutes. That's true, but it also would be weird. Uh, okay, so, so then if we take out the scale of the entire solar system, in fact, everything fits in, again, into this natural unit, astronomical units, the distance from the sun out to uh, the furthest objects, which uh, depending on your generation, you can call Pluto or planets or dwarf planets or something like that. Um, these are about, that's about 50 astronomical units. So the whole diameter is about twice that, 100 astronomical units. Again, a very natural scale for talking about planetary systems. Um, and that's about six light hours, right? If you multiply eight light minutes by 50, you get six light hours. And this is where we get a little interesting in, in terms of sort of uh, real mission planning. If we actually want to explore out in our solar system, uh, these kind of time scales become problematic. And in fact, uh, that's uh, uh, an issue that's going to come up very shortly. There's a satellite that's called the New Horizons mission. Who's heard of the New Horizons mission? So one of the interesting things that New Horizons is doing is that they're soliciting um, uh, messages to attach to its uh, computer drive because as soon as this thing goes past Pluto, it's just going to keep going out outside the solar system. So it's one of our sort of beacons of humanity that's going to travel for, for many, many, many millions of years, however long it lasts. Um, but right now, it's just at Pluto. In fact, it's going to pass by just this summer, uh, July 14th, the day before my birthday, so I'm very excited. Um, <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> here's the problem. The light travel time to communicate with that satellite is about six hours, which means the round trip time, if you want to hear something from the satellite and then tell it to do something else, it's already moved for half a day. Right? So real-time control of these kind of satellites is out of the question. You can't just have a little sort of, you know, Game Boy and kind of, you know, move it around and point, hey, I want to see what that looks like or like that. It's too late, so I move way past it, right? This is one of the features of living in a universe in which the speed of light is constant and, and relatively slow when you compare to large distances. Um, so there's no command and control when it flies by. Everything is pre-programmed, and we just hope it works. That's billions of dollars of work. Yes, sir? Uh, when did they launch it? Um, a good question. Um, I'll have to actually look it up. I don't remember the exact date, um, but I'll, I'll look it up. Yes, sir. Ah, yeah. Good, excellent question. So there is a slight, what we call eccentricity, <coughs> to the orbit <coughs> of the Earth around the Sun. Um, that variation is actually pretty small compared to the size of the orbit. It's something like a, a couple percent. Um, and so the AU is kind of an average uh, of the total orbit. We'll talk a little bit more about orbits when we talk about Kepler's laws and how planets move around stars. Um, there's a quantity called the semi-major axis, which is again kind of the average distance that a planet orbits around a star. Um, and that's what's taken as the AU. So sometimes the sun's a, Earth's a little bit further away from an AU and sometimes a little closer than AU, but that's within a few percent. Any other questions? Okay. So we've now kind of sampled the scale size of planetary systems, and that's of course important for our question of astrobiology, because as far as we know, life originates on planets, at least the one experiment of life that we know about originates on planets. So let's take a break and look a little bit more closely to the composition of these planetary systems, or at least our planetary systems. Uh, and so just classifying based on their properties, what we find is sort of two 
types of main planets, and I'm going to sort of eject Pluto from this discussion for the time being. Um, we've got terrestrial Earth-like planets. Earth-like because <coughs> Earth is one of them. All right, uh, terrestrial is actually another name for that because terrestrial is the Latin verb for Earth-like. Um, but these are the planets that are closest to the sun, and they all have very similar properties. They're very rocky or metal. They contain a lot of rocks and metal. They're very dense, um, and they uh, have solid surfaces. And of course, that's pretty important if you want to, you know, develop life that walks around on, on land. Um, and of course, the only one we know about that has life right now is Earth, and it also has water on surface. But all of these planets uh, have some kind of solid surface on them and are very, very dense objects. The other interesting thing is that the only one of these that has any kind of real moon, and I'll say real, because there'll, there'll be an exception in a second, is really our moon, all right, the moon. That's pretty original. Um, you, Mars has a couple of tiny little rocky moons, but in fact, we actually think these moons actually may be uh, captured comets that are kind of odd in shape and they're very, very tiny. Uh, they're peculiar in their orbits. Uh, we think that, in fact, the only planet in that inner part of the solar system that has a moon is is, is the Earth, and that might have some effect on, on how we think about life. Uh, moving further out, we have much bigger planets than that. All of these little planets is in this little graphic right here. So these are factors of 100 larger than the Earth. Jupiter's size is about 100 times bigger than the Earth. That gives you sort of a size scale. Uh, and these have many, many, many moons. And again, they're... They're actually different composition. They're mostly made out of gas. In fact, they're made of light gas, hydrogen and helium, more than sort of the solid surface of material that we have here on, on Earth, Mars, or Venus. And there's a dividing line. Somewhere around three astronomical units, you go from having rocky planets to having these big gas giant planets. And as we see, we'll see later on, this is actually a clue to understanding how our solar system formed in the first place. But for now, this is just a pattern that we see in our solar system. Uh, moving further out, we've now got a whole collection of things that we've reclassified as dwarf planets, but they are really actually different from these other types of planets I've talked about. Uh, whereas our planets, our terrestrial planets, are rocky and made of metal, uh, these objects are actually made mostly of rock and ice, right? Things like water ice, ammonia ice, uh, methane ice, these are actually more like ice balls, kind of dirty ice balls is one of the ways that we talk about them. Um, and so that obviously includes Pluto, which amazingly contains actually several little moons around it. Um, but also other things like this is a, our conception of Haumea, which is a weird sort of oblong shaped thing. It's oblong because it's actually rotating very quickly. Um, and it also has a couple of moons around it. So these are very different kinds of objects in terms of composition. And as we'll see later on, also how they orbit around the sun. Right? But these are, these are things that we've just really been discovering sort of the last 50 years. Now, I mentioned that the giant planets have all lots of moons. I mean, Jupiter has something like 70 or, or 60 or 70 moons around it. Uh, some of those moons are actually quite substantial. And they look not too unlike the terrestrial planets that are closer to the, are closer to the sun. So these are the four largest moons uh, around Jupiter. These are the Galilean moons. Um, I forgot to bring my, my cookie version of these moons. I'll bring that next time. Um, so as I mentioned, moons are very rare around the terrestrial planets, but they're very common around the gas giants. And these things, uh, some of them are, are kind of worlds unto their own. Um, they are, have a lot more water in, in many cases than, than the terrestrial planets. And again, that has a lot to do with where they formed, what kind of materials were around when they were built. Um, but they also have a lot of diversity about them. So uh, this is an order of distance from Jupiter. This is a, the moon called Io. This is the most volcanic body in the solar system. It is continually erupting. We see eruptions, have, new eruptions happen basically on kind of a monthly time scale. Um, and we can actually view those from the ground. Uh, and we'll talk about the reason for this, but it's also, it has a lot to do with the fact that it's very close to Jupiter. It gets stretched a lot by Jupiter, and that's caused a lot of tectonic activity inside the moon. Now, when I say volcanism, this is not the kind of volcanism we have here on Earth. Uh, this moon is made of more icy type of things, so the kind of volcanism that happens is more kind of ice flows that pop out. Um, but this is still a very active moon. As you move out, you get to these bodies that are very cold, uh, very solid, riddled with craters, um, and very, very, kind of almost similar to our moon, um, but in many cases bigger. This is this moon here, uh, which is Ganymede, is actually bigger than the planet Mercury. So they can be very substantial bosses. And as you see, these are places where we're actually also interested in finding life. Um, going further out, uh, we have whole collections of little bodies, literally trillions of little objects that are floating around. 
Um, there is a belt of asteroids that reside between Mars and Jupiter, and we'll talk a little bit about why there might be a belt there as opposed to something else. Um, but even further out, I talked about Pluto and, and, and Haumea, but there's actually a huge collection of objects that are, again, rock and ice bodies that are orbiting at sort of large distances uh, way past the orbit of Neptune. Right? This is part of our solar system, and as we see, it's actually part of another clue at how our solar system formed in the first place. Even further, we have these things called comets. These are really gorgeous objects when they come by the sun, these beautiful tails that come out. Um, but in fact, very, very few of those comets come by the, by the sun at any time. There's literally trillions of these objects that are very, very far out, uh, thousands of astronomical units away from the sun, and only rarely do they kind of pop back in and pass by the sun. We had a really spectacular one uh, last, not this past December, but the December before, um, Comet Ison. Did anybody hear about Comet Ison a couple years ago? Okay. Um, it basically came from the outer parts of the solar system and plunged right into the sun. It sucks to be a comet sometimes. Um, <laughs> but we see, you know, little, little ones of these bodies coming into the sun sort of on a sort of time scale of a few every year. Um, and again, where they, the fact that they're way out there tells us a little bit about how our solar system formed in the first place. Now, I've left out one really important object in the solar system. Anyone guess what that is? That puts the soul in the solar system. Yeah, it's the sun, all right? Uh, this is the sun. It's sort of two pictures. This is what you would see if you were to uh, look at it uh, at optical wavelengths. Um, we would actually do this at some point. I have some nice glasses where you can actually stare at the sun and not bring your eyes out. Um, but this is, we can also look at it at other wavelengths. Uh, the sun is so bright that we can point basically anything at this and get some really big, great pictures of it. Um, but this is the thing that's at the center of our solar system. Uh, it's the most massive object in the solar system, and because of that, it's all, everything in our solar system is orbiting at some level around the sun. Um, and it's also different in its composition than at least the terrestrial planets in that it's mostly made out of these lightest elements, hydrogen and helium. About 73% hydrogen, about 25% helium. That's by mass. So you measure the mass of elements in the, in the sun. Almost all of it is, is these two light elements. Um, we'll talk about how it works in a second, but uh, you know, it, it, the main process is nuclear fusion. And in order to do that, we go back to Einstein's E equals mc squared, the transformation of mass to energy. In order to produce all of the light that the sun puts out, the light that we need to have here on Earth, uh, it has to basically transform about 4 million tons of itself into energy every second. Now that sounds like a really bad thing, because the sun might just disappear if it's doing that very fast, but 4 million tons is a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of the mass of the sun. It's not actually going to change mass very much at all over its lifetime. All right, uh, just to sort of get a little more conversation going, so I said the sun is the most massive object in the universe, or in the solar system. Uh, what fraction of the solar system's total mass do you think the sun is? Take a thought about it for a second. We don't have any clickers, so I'm going to do this just by hand. Okay, who says A? Okay, who says B? Okay, who says C? Okay, who says D? No one for D. Okay. Uh, so that's a pretty good mix. Um, I want you to turn to your neighbor and see if you can convince them that your particular answer is better than theirs using some kind of argument of discussion. Take 30 seconds to go. <laughs> Okay, let's let's do a quick revo. Who thinks who thinks ninety percent? Oh, we blew that away. Okay, that's interesting. Who says 
Okay, ninety nine point nine percent. Anyone go to one hundred percent? No. All right. Uh, so this is a hard one because this is not something that you easily have a sort of idea about. And uh, I will tell you the answer. In fact, it's ninety nine point nine percent. It is a humongous fraction. Basically, the solar system doesn't matter. The planets don't matter at all when you think about it in terms of mass. The sun is everything except 0.1%. And most of that 0.1% is where? In Jupiter, the biggest planet in the solar system. All right. If we go down to the size of the Earth and stuff like that, Earth is tiny, 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 nothing compared to the mass of the sun or the mass of the rest of the solar system. It's a trivial amount. So, you know. The thing we're most interested in is our planet Earth, because that's where we live, is actually a very, it's kind of a crumb in the process of solar system formation. Um, and that's both good and bad, right? It's bad because if it's just a crumb, it may not be something that forms that often. But if it is a crumb, maybe it forms a lot, because it's easy to make lots of crumbs. Right? We'll see that in just a moment. OK, so just keep that in mind, though. The sun is basically everything. The solar system is kind of the remnants of stuff that happened in the process of making the sun. All right, now, I'm sure you are aware that the sun is a star, and it's one of many stars in our galaxy, in our universe. And if you look out at the, uh, at the image uh, out in the universe, this is a picture down in the southern hemisphere, so I'll make it a little bit darker so you can see it. That's better. Um, this is a particular constellation. Uh, actually, anybody know what this constellation is? Have you ever been to the southern hemisphere? Exactly right. It's the Southern Cross. These sort of four stars here uh, make up one of the most important constellations down in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, and those stars, if you can see, this is a color uh, image uh, taken by an amateur astronomer. Uh, and you can see that these stars have different colors about them. Right? They have actually different <laughs> properties. They don't all look the same. Um, and this is actually a very important sort of realization in sort of understanding uh, <laughs> understanding uh, the different properties of stars as we start looking out into the universe and seeing what they are. So just to get, again, to give kind of a scale of things, uh, other type of stars that are out there can scale from uh, things that are about a tenth of the sun. These are red dwarfs. They turn out to be the most common stars in the galaxy. There's 70% of the stars in the galaxy are these little tiny red things that we can't actually see with our eyes. Um, we've got something like the sun, and then we've got really big stars, giant stars, blue giants, blue super giants. We'll see where those stars why those stars are so big, why they're called giants and supergiants, as we talk about stellar evolution. Uh, but just again, just to give an idea of the scale size, we go from something like a tenth of the mass of the sun to up to 300 times. This is kind of the upper limit. Uh, in fact, we can make really <coughs> tiny stars that are almost planetary masses, and about a tenth of the size out of things that are just tremendous in size, very, very big, 2,000 times the rays of the sun. But notice the scale here is I'm writing everything in terms of solar radii. I'm using the sun as the anchor for my distance scale. That's very useful. For <laughs> okay. <clears throat> All right. Now, the thing that stars do, and again, we'll talk about this in a little bit more detail as we talk about cell evolution, um, is uh, is they, they create stuff. Right? They actually have a job. Who knew? All right? They are the factories of the elements in the universe. When the universe began, uh, the only elements we actually had, sorry, the color's not so great, are the three lightest ones, hydrogen, helium, and lithium. Remember I mentioned that the sun is made of mostly hydrogen and helium. So the sun is actually made of most of the stuff that the universe sort of started off with. Um, but everything else, and by the way, everything else that we are, because we are not mostly made out of hydrogen and helium, we are made of other things like carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, calcium, right? Things that you're supposed to ingest so your, your bones stay nice and hard. Um, these are all things that are actually manufactured in stars through fusion processes by combining our light elements, hydrogen and helium, together in order to fuse bigger atoms and in the process release tremendous amounts of energy. It's that energy that we actually see that's emitted ultimately from the surface of the stars, and that's, that's why we can see the stars, because we can see their light. Right? That light has to be generated through this process, and in the, in the sort of the <coughs> outcome of that process, the pollution of that process, are all the elements that we're made out of. So we need stars to make this stuff. Now, if you're wearing, anybody wearing any gold or silver jewelry? <coughs> I got some, all right? Star had to die for that. You feel good about that? <laughs> so it turns out all these elements are made inside stars just through normal fusion processes. But these elements are, are actually too hard to make. It turns out that once you get to around iron or nickel, 
you don't actually make any energy when you make heavier elements. So stars kind of stop manufacturing elements at that point. This rest of this periodic table, almost all of the rest of the periodic table happens in cataclysmic explosions of stars when they get to the end of their lifetimes, probably supernovae. You've probably heard that term before. All of these elements are made in supernovae, including, uh, where's my gold? <coughs> Silver, gold, copper, right? Getting pennies. Pennies have to die. Stars have to die for your pennies. It's terrible, <laughs> right? Um, all of these elements are created in stellar death. And again, we see these elements around our environment all over the place. And so this is actually a clue that, you know, we're actually kind of in the later stages in the evolution of the, of the universe or galaxies because there had to be stars that were here before us and died in order to produce the elements that we see around us all over the place. So this gives, again, starts to give us a picture, at least in terms of time, of where we are in terms of the evolution of the universe. Okay, so that's what stars are and what they do. Let's get back to our time, our distance scale. So the nearest stars uh, to us are Alpha Centauri and Proxima Centauri. Uh, there are their units in kilometers. This is a crazy number of zeros here, uh, but we can write that into uh, scientific notation. It turns out it's about 10 to the 16 meters. You remember seeing 10 to the 16 meters before? <coughs> that was our light year, right? It turns out a light year, the, the distance that light travels in one year is about 10 to the 16 meters. And so these light years are a natural unit for describing the distances between stars, at least in our galaxy, or at least locally in our galaxy. Right? So we have an astronomical unit for describing distances in planetary systems. We have light years for describing distances uh, of stars, and, and actually generally distances within our galaxy. Okay. Uh, now, how do we know this? How do we, this is a crazy distance. We can't walk. 39 trillion kilometers and figure out that that's the distance of the star. Um, so what we do for these is we actually use uh, a, a tactic called parallax. So I want everyone right now to kind of stick your thumb out directly in front of you. Some of you may have done this exercise at some point. Uh, pick a, here is, here is your reference point, okay? So I want you to look at that with one, your left eye closed and with your right eye closed. What do you see? What happens with this ruler, say, compared to the screen behind it, or the shadow behind it? Actually, I have no idea because I've never done this experiment before. <laughs> Nothing? It moves, it, like when you look at it one eye and look at the other, it jump. Well, it appears to jump. It appears to jump. Okay. Is everyone else, is everyone seeing that? It's actually interesting because the back room is probably going to be different. Do you see that in the back room as well? Okay. So what you're doing right now is, is, is parallax. The reason, and it's actually probably the reason that we evolved two eyes as opposed to being cyclops, is that ability to see different perspectives from different eye sockets uh, gives us an idea of measuring distances. Right? We don't usually walk around doing this. Right? Our brain has sort of figured out how to translate the information from both eyes uh, directly. Um, but the separation of our eyes is critical to understanding what's sort of in the near field and what's in the far field. You can imagine that you know, our very ancient pre-human ancestors who had two eyes probably did a lot better at avoiding predators than our one-eyed ancestors. Right? So uh, you can argue about their waiting for that, uh, that case. We can't do that with our eyes. Our eyes are too, too narrow apart to see something that's 10 to the 16 meters. Right? This is only maybe you know, a tenth of a meter or something like that. So in order to actually make a measurement that that's far away, uh, we don't use our eyes, we use the Earth's orbit. And so as the Earth goes around the sun, when we take a picture of a star nearby, and nearby is going to be order of light years, that's not too near to us in human scale, but it's very near to us in galaxy scale. Um, we can see that it moves relative to the background stars if we observe it, say, in the, in the winter versus the summer. We use the orbit of the, of the Earth around the sun to be our two eyes, right? Just two eyes looking at different places, <laughs> right? And that allows us to do exactly the same thing when you give your thumb as we can do with, with stars and distance in, in their scale. So we have something like millions of stars in which we know the distance very accurately by this process of parallax. And uh, as we'll talk about probably later in the course, this is kind of the first sort of rung in the ladder of understanding distances <coughs> out in the universe at large. This is a direct measurement of the distances of stars. Now, I should make one point. This depends on 
this distance, which is what? One astronomical unit. So we couldn't use this until we knew what this distance was. And there's a long, beautiful history about how we actually figured out our distance to the sun. It's actually harder than you think. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But in any case, because we live on this planet that orbits around the sun in this way, we can actually make the measurements of distances of other stars. If we lived on a different planet, we might may, may not be able to do this, or we may be able to do this much better. That's something for sort of speculative thought. All right, now, the so going back and looking at our constellations, so then here's the Southern Cross, uh, and uh, here are some of the distances that we've measured for these stars. You can see there are units of hundreds of light years, so these are relatively distant away. And look over here, here's Alpha Centauri. So if you ever see the Southern Cross, you can actually find it by taking the cross and pointing down. You can find our nearest star of the sun. Yes. Is it astronomically unit from the center of the sun to the center of the Earth, or is it from surface to surface? Uh, good question. So the so the distance from center of the sun to center of the Earth roughly is about 10 to the 11 meters. The size of the Earth. Do you remember what that number is? Smaller than that. Smaller. So it's about 10 to the seven, give or take. Right. The Earth. The sun is about 10 to the eight. That's two, that's three or four orders of magnitude smaller. So It'd be like saying, you know, what's the difference between one meter and one meter plus a centimeter? It's so we take it as the centers, but it's there's not much difference there. You'll find in astronomy, many things are not done at you know ten orders of magnitude precision. They're done at sort of n order of magnitude precision. That's mostly what we'll say within the slides. Good question. Okay, so these are. Examples of some of the brightest stars that we can see with our eyes. Uh, there are other stars that are further away. Uh, one of the things we'll try to look at in, during our night viewing uh, this next week is the Orion Nebula. This is the nearest uh, location of star formation. These are stars that are uh, fairly new baby stars. They're only about a million years old, which still seems incredibly long. But from a star lifetime, this is fairly newborn. Um, we can see the constellation with our eye, but in a telescope, you can actually see the stars that are in there and really forming. This is about 400 light years away. There are other clusters of stars that are even further than that. This is the uh, Messier 3 globular cluster. This is like, actually a collection of old stars. This is about 34,000 light years away. So there's big jumps in distance here. Um, so we're, I'm showing these because these are patterns of stars that we see out in the night sky. Probably the most spectacular patterns of stars, if you can get to a dark enough spot, uh, is this pattern of stars, which is the Milky Way. How many of you have seen the Milky Way with your own eyes? That's a sad, sad, bad thing. <laughs> so uh, someday, I want I can't do, actually organize this as a class trip, but someday I would really like you guys to go out to the desert, if not too far away, on a moonless night and see this. This is your home galaxy. You can see it beautifully out in dark skies. You cannot see it at all here in San Diego. I tried. Actually, when we had a, we had a power outage like a couple of years ago where all the lights went out, and then you could see it. It was great. Um, <laughs> but not great for some people. It was great for astronomers. Uh, but to go out to dark space, you can see this stream of stars. This is the, the Milky Way. Um, and most of what you see is actually, so you see this sort of very fine pattern of light. Uh, it was Galileo in, this, in the early 17th century was the first to really re realize that all this sort of milky substance, Milky Way, was actually millions and millions of individual stars. And he had to have a telescope to actually figure that out. Uh, and there's also all this dark stuff that kind of over on top of this. Uh, these are interstellar clouds of gas and dust. This is actually the material that makes stars. And again, when we talk about star formation, uh, we'll see the connection between those two things. But the most amazing part of this is the pattern, right? It is a straight line up through the sky, right? And when you sort of flip yourself in geometry, this gives us an idea of where we are inside this galaxy. So this is a schematic of it. Um, so in that sort of movie we saw pulling away from the galaxy, you saw this flat spiral. In fact, we are inside the spiral. When we look up in the sky and we see this swath of light, we're actually looking at the plane, the edge of our Milky Way, looking in. If we were not there, we would see something that's more kind of circular and flat across the entire sky. But because we're looking at this line, we're actually looking at the plane of the galaxy. So there we are, uh, looking in uh, and looking out in different directions. Um, if we want to actually put a scale on this, uh, this is just a uh, uh, sort of artistic map. It would be very hard to get this picture. We'd have to send a probe out something like 100,000 light years away. It might take a little while, a little expensive. Let's have an artist draw it instead. Right, so um, now I should say we actually know a lot of this structure very well 
from measurements taken from the Earth. There's a, a lot of uh, interesting tricks to measure, for example, the, the motions of the stars and the gas and sort of make a map of where that stuff has to be. There's a whole field of science of trying to figure out what our galaxy looks like from the inside. So this is one model of that. Um, and you can see that here, again, on the scale, we're talking about light years, but we're talking about tens of thousands of light years. We're about 26,000 light years from the center of the galaxy. Uh, and we're probably somewhere on kind of halfway out. It's a little hard to put an edge on the galaxy because, in fact, stars continue to travel out uh, as you go further and further away. They get, get fainter and fainter and harder to see. But we're somewhere sort of in the middle. We're sort of between these sort of big spiral arms that we see uh, also in other galaxies. But that gives you kind of a scale of the size of, the, of our galaxy. And not only that, because we know that the nearest stars are something like a few light years away, and we know the size of the entire galaxy, we can actually estimate how many stars are in that system. When you do all that calculation, the number you get is something like 10 to the 11, give or take, order of magnitude. Now, that's a huge number, again. That's why you got to put in scientific notation. Um, but it's a finite number. And uh, when we had the discussion yesterday about, you know, do you think that there's life out in the universe, a lot of things that I heard from, from, uh, from you students and also from the students that are in my other class uh, on, on astrobiology um, often say that there has to be life in other worlds because there's an infinite number of stars, it's an infinite number of planets, and the chances that there's something out there has got to be, it's got to happen, right? It's got infinite. Infinite time anything is, is going to be something. But it's not infinite. We have a finite number of stars in our galaxy, and we have a finite number of galaxies in the universe. Um, it's a really big number, and it's a much bigger number than we're usually used to dealing with, but it's still a finite number. So keep that in mind. Because later on as we talk about the probability of finding life, we're going to be multiplying this big number by very small numbers of uh, probabilities. And so we'll have to see if that actually works out to be bigger than one. Okay. So, uh, so that's sort of the size scale of the galaxy. So keep in mind that uh, if the near stars are kind of light years away, galaxies are about 100,000 times bigger than that. And as we keep progressing out, we go back to finding other galaxies out in space. Uh, these are written again in kind of crazy long numbers. Uh, but these can be written back down into light years in terms of millions of light years, or you can write that as a, a mega light year, right? If you want to write that down short like that. But that's the natural size scale of galaxies between each other. Now, one thing I want to point out is we've had to jump a big step between talking about one star to another star of order of light year, then one galaxy to another galaxy, a million light years. When we step out in sort of scales in the universe, what we find is that there's lots of big gaps, right? There's lots of scales where there really isn't anything, right? There's big spaces where there's kind of nothing. Um, and this is, again, going to be sort of a clue to how our universe has sort of structured itself, right? It's a very sort of sparse structuring, right? We could have stars all over the universe and just kind of uniformly <coughs> distribute it, but we don't. We have these very isolated galaxies that are very far apart from each other, uh, and those distances are much bigger than the stars within the galaxies. So these are some clues that are important to looking at patterns in how our universe formed. Um, the galaxies you see on this artistic drawing are also very different. So in fact, we have different types of galaxies that are out here. Our galaxy is one of these that has, as we think, a kind of a spiral arms and maybe even a bar that goes across the middle. Um, but in fact, galaxy comes in all sorts of different shapes and sizes. Um, I don't even have here irregular galaxies, which are kind of just big sort of Rorschach test plots all over the, place, the sky. Um, and in fact, we think a lot of this has to do uh, with the how uh, galaxies evolve over time, right? Stars, it's not just that stars evolve, but actually whole galaxy systems can also change over time. And so there's all sorts of studies in examining how, for example, elliptical galaxies, which are very round sharp of things, are related to these spirals like the galaxy that we're in. And this may seem like it's getting really far away from the idea of life in the universe, but it's not a you know a question we could ask if you know what would the habitability of stars and planets around here compared to the habitability of stars and planets in these kind of systems? If we really want to look at life in the entire universe. Now, um, when you look at these pictures, especially the spirals, it kind of looks like these things are are kind of almost rotating, like spiraling around. And in fact, they are to some degree. There's gravity acting on these systems, stars are pulling against each other. There's a lot more mass in the middle than there is in the outside. 
And so you can actually measure how the stars go around the centers. And that gives us an idea of the masses of these galaxies. And um, a result you've probably heard of before is one of the most amazing things is that if you were to just say, well, I think it's just stars in our galaxy, and because the stars kind of peter out as you go further away, you'd expect that the fastest stars are in the middle where there's a lot of mass, and then the stars would start to go more slowly around the outside as you move away. Right? We'll talk a little bit more about how that relation comes about from Newton's laws later on. So this is what you would predict from that, but in fact what we see is that the stars just keep going faster and faster and faster as you get further and further away. And you can't make that from a system where it's just made out of stars. So by studying these galaxies, studying the motions of stars around them, these physical quantities, we actually infer this really amazing thing that in fact there's a lot more stuff in galaxies than just the stuff that we're made out of, the atoms, uh, you know, electrons, ice cream, okay, all that stuff is a tiny, tiny fraction of what the mass that's actually inside the universe, inside galaxies in the universe. And because we have no idea what that is, we give it the very colorful name of dark matter. It's actually dark because we can't see it. But it's also something we don't know, and it's one of the big mysteries of the universe that we're still trying to figure out. Right? That comes from studying galaxies. All right, we're going to keep moving out. So. Remember that sort of scale between galaxies is like a million light years. We can take another jump out and start to see that those galaxies themselves form patterns. They are not just randomly scattered around the universe. They actually form this really amazing complex web. Right? They line up in lines, uh, in walls. Uh, there's gaps and voids in between them. The scale that we're looking at this now, each one of these kind of pixels contains many thousands or millions of galaxies. So we're looking at the structure of all the galaxies in the universe. This scale is now getting up to billions of light years. And this number, billions of light years, is now kind of the natural unit for the entire universe itself. So if you want to talk about you know, other universes or something like that, we're talking about the universe itself, we're now talking about billions of light years. Remember the idea of light years. Right? Light year is a distance that light travels in the year. It also gives us a sense of time. Right? One light year away, what we see at one light year is itself one year old. We're seeing it one year in the past. So when we're looking out ever further away from our sun on the scale of billions of light years, we are really looking deep into the past. Right? Even further past, I mean, if this is on scale of sort of half to one and a half billion light years, if we get out to, say, 5 billion light years, we are now looking at the universe before there was even a sun. Right? So this starts playing some big mind tricks with you. So how far can we go? Before I answer that question, one of the things that's interesting about these clusters as they clump up is that there's so much mass contained in these things that you actually see that the mass in the clusters can actually act as a lens to bend light of the galaxies behind it. And we can actually see galaxies behind these clusters because they're literally focused by all the mass uh, in front of them. And when you measure how much that focusing happens, how much bending happens, this is another way that we see that there's a lot more mass than we can actually see with our eyes. This is another detection of dark matter in the universe. Right? Something that we see at sort of large, very large scales. So I keep looking out further and further and further. This is probably the deepest image that you can ever take of, of the night sky. This is a, something called the Hubble Extreme Deep Field. Uh, you'll notice in astronomy that there's all these superlatives that get dropped. There's like, this used to be the deep field, and then it was the uh, ultra deep field, and now it's the extreme deep field. I'm not sure what happens after that. Um, but everything that you see here except this and one up there is a galaxy. There's literally thousands and thousands of galaxies in this image. And just like I showed those pictures of stars of having all sorts of different colors, the galaxies themselves also appear to have all sorts of different colors and shapes and properties. And it turns out many of these very red things are red not because the galaxies themselves are intrinsically red, but it's because they are so far away, they are actually moving away from us because of cosmic expansion. I'll talk about that in just a moment. Um, but just to emphasize a little bit here, if I just take this little segment up here and zoom in, you see just tons and tons of stuff, and now you can see even like the little faint stuff that you can't see with your eye in the middle. <coughs> there are so many galaxies in here, and we can literally see some of the farthest things in the universe in this picture. But some of these things are really, really red. All right? You 
these guys right here. You know, most of these are kind of very nearby blue galaxies, but these things are very, very red. Turns out that they're not red because, as I mentioned, they're not red because they're intrinsically red. But one of the things that was discovered in the 20th century is that the further away you look at galaxies, those galaxies are all moving away from us. This is something called the Hubble Law. Uh, this was discovered by Edwin Hubble back in the 1920s, but has been uh, revisited many, many times since then. Uh, it's a linear relationship between how far a galaxy is, and this is in units called megaparsecs, which is kind of like millions of light years, um, and how fast they are moving away from us. And the further out you go, the faster those galaxies are moving away from us. There seems to be this property of the universe where things are just moving away, and as far as they go, the, the faster they move away. A nice linear relationship. The slope of this line is something called the Hubble constant. And in the units that we've been talking about, it's about 22 kilometers per second per millions of light years. So a galaxy that's a million light years away is moving 22 kilometers per second away from us. One that's a hundred million light years away is moving 22,000, sorry, 2,200 kilometers per second. You can keep going as you go further and further out. It's an amazing linear relationship between and this is evidence that, in fact, the universe is not a static thing, right? Up to now, we've just been talking about the sizes and scales and shapes of the universe. We haven't really talked about how the universe changes. But this measurement really tells us something about how the universe is not something that is fixed in time. And in fact, that whole idea of cosmic expansion uh, gets us to sort of our history of what we know about the universe today. If you take that cosmic expansion and you just extrapolate it back, a very simple exercise. What you find is that there's some time in the past where everything has to be kind of coming from one point. If everything's expanding outward and we measure that expansion, just running the movie backwards gets us back to everything being in one point at one time. And then very early on in the class, I mentioned this time scale about 13 billion years of the age of the universe. That's the estimate you get when you do this very simple extrapolation back, running the movie back, to some time when everything's in the same place. And this frames our sort of understanding of the evolution of the, of the universe itself. So in one minute, the whole history of the universe, uh, what we think is that there's some part in the past where everything that's in our universe is in some incredibly compact state. It's hard to say it's in a small place because it is the place, right? We're not inside something, although there's some theories that talk about that maybe possibility. But if we talk about the universe as a whole, it is just super compact. And whatever trigger, or we don't know what that is, causes it to expand. And very early on, in fact, it expands very, very rapidly. It literally explodes out into something. We don't know what that something is, but it gets bigger. And it gets bigger so fast that, in fact, when you look at it in a very distant universe, you can see the point where the universe gets cold enough where you can start seeing light coming through it. That's something called the cosmic microwave background. In fact, that's a very hot surface, but because the universe has expanded out, it's actually expanded out. I'm blowing your mind away too much. Yeah, I'm going to go quickly, so sorry. We'll get the notes. Um, after that, the universe just steadily expands over time. And the scary thing is that's interesting is in the last few years, we've actually seen that the universe doesn't just kind of expand out linearly. It's actually expanding faster and faster and faster over time. This is something called uh, the cosmic acceleration or the expansion acceleration. And this is evidence of yet another unknown stuff in the universe called dark energy, which is a pressure which is literally pushing our universe apart. All of this comes from just making measurements of distances and velocities of different objects in our universe. And it's a really amazing picture. It may not be the final right picture, but it's the best that we know so far. And I'm going to end there because I'm running out of time, but uh, sit on that for a little while. And uh, I will see you on Tuesday for our next lecture. And don't forget that we'll have a night lab on Tuesday as well. Thank <laughs> you.